Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War Two TV. And what, in fact, will be the last show of this week. And next week, it's Eighth Air Force Week. So I hope you've noted down all the shows and will be there to join us for that. But today, we are back to the summer of 1940. And we're talking about Dunkirk. But today, from the German point of view, if you're a World War II TV fan, you'll know that with Matthew Powell, we looked at the RAF defense of France. We've looked at the myth of the little ships with Philip Weir. We did a fantastic show with Ian McSkinnon about the uh, Royal Scots Fusiliers defending the Ypres Canal. But now we're looking at the whole operation from the German point of view and asking the questions, do, did the German army and military then see it the same way as the British and the Allied military see it? How, do, how is it seen now, uh, 80 plus years on? And to find out the answers, I'll bring in my guest, Robert Kershaw. So his new book, and that's what we're here to pr promote and plug, is... Uh, Dunkirk in 1940, the German view of Dunkirk. And Robert Kershaw, of course, is an absolute military legend. He has written about Moscow, Balaclava, Omaha Beach, Waterloo, the Somme, Arnhem. The list goes on and on. And I'm delighted he's here on World War II TV tonight. So good evening, Bob. How are you today? Hi. Yeah, good evening, everyone. And I hope you are flattered by the introduction there. So so Dunkirk, it's, it's all tied up with... Churchill and imagery and the blitz spirit and and everything else and and then there's the German side of it which is tied up with the mystique of the blitzkrieg and and the German efficiency in 1940 so before we get to your book and and the the, the study you've done to look at it from a German point of view how would you describe since 1940 to now how the historiography of the understanding of Dunkirk has has gone well, I think it starts with Winston Churchill's history of the Second World War. And the victors normally write the history, and that was the case here. And he was very much extolling the way he handled the crisis. And Dunkirk is, in military respects, virtually a total catastrophe mm. in that the British Army uh, left probably over 90% of its equipment and vehicles um, in France and only escaped with its manpower. So that is a defeat uh, in any terms. Um, but government propaganda really, and later lauded by Churchill's book himself, um, extolled it as a, a moral victory over the enemy who assumed that he was going to take the surrender of this lot on the beaches, and that didn't happen. And ever since then, of course, um, cinema has really taken over the story, starting perhaps with the John Mills um, black and white epic in the 19, late 1950s, I think, or early 60s. And indeed, even today, you, you have this very emotional roller coaster of our boys getting away and that is, in fact, the case. It was very much a moral victory, but technically a total disaster. Um, so I happened on this story really by accident in that I was serving in uh, NATO headquarters in Brussels, and I was asked to um, prepare and project the German view as part of a military battlefield tour that took in the Army, Navy and the Air Force. And because I speak and read German, I, I, I was asked to present the German view. And I was fortunate in that I could ask them to get me all the documentation. And they got for me from the Bundes archive all the post-action division and core reports and what Luftwaffe uh, reports um, that survived. And the missing element, of course, was the human bit, but in the event, the battlefield tour had to be um, cancelled, although I'd walked the ground, but it was cancelled because of pressure of world events at the time. The London bombings and Afghanistan uh, was heating up. So I was left with all this documentation. And actually, I had about a year to go before I left the army. And so I stuck it all in the attic, um, pending probably a book because I decided to become a full time author on leaving the army cut a very long story short nine books later i hadn't written it i didn't even know the quality of the stuff it lay in the attic and when the pandemic struck um there was no opportunity for me to go out and travel to research and i thought well i've got this stuff in the attic so down it came and i went for it for the first time i was also fortunate in that there are very few personal accounts from the german side of dunkirk and I managed to purchase those from the same source of the guy that did the research that got me the documents. 
but again, I, I hadn't read them and I had no real idea of, of, of what I was looking for. What I didn't want to do, of course, was a, a repeat of previous histories about this uh, moral victory in the face of stupendous odds and all the rest of it. But I wasn't in any way seeking to um, besmirch the achievement of, of, of what was actually done. So um, as I started going through the documents, I had a rudimentary knowledge of the Dunkirk battle. And I was thinking a lot of this stuff is not making sense to me. And then it all then the picture started to emerge that this was actually very dissimilar to what people were writing now. And I thought, I can't believe this. This is 80 years after the event and nobody's really bothered to get to grips with this stuff. So I persevered and I carried on. And to my mind, as an ex-military person, I thought the key event was when the um, British fighting elements were evacuated from Dunkirk. They were the key men that needed to be saved. Everything that had gone before and all the disorganized uh, flotsam that you see on Hollywood and whatever and everybody frightened and whatever, they're, they're the logistic guys and the stragglers who've got to the coast first. The key element were the fighting divisions that fought a pretty skillful rear guard all the way back to the coast. And they got those guys off over a period of four days, really, at the end of May and the beginning of June. And there were a number of missed opportunities, really, when you get into the detail of the German side, when those troops could have been snatched off the beaches. And the bottom line is not so much how much material you can destroy. Um, it is really that number of prisoners, if they'd taken them, would have been a hostage to the political negotiations that would have happened. Basically, UK Churchill, you've got to surrender if you want your men back. And they would have been a hostage to fortune. In the event, of course, they um, got back and, and those fighting elements were the seed corn of the later regiments that fought in the Western Desert and in other theatres and finished the war. So they provided a veteran carder for a fledgling um, British army that was expanded to come back really at D-Day, coming back the other direction. And I suppose the bottom line was that what came across to me looking at the German perspective was their lack of appreciation being a landlocked country and essentially a land army, they never really got to grips with the potential for the Royal Navy to lift that number of men and do the things that it did because it was beyond their experience, beyond their compass. And so really I narrowed it down to that four day period and, and that was the period I focused in on. Why didn't the Germans actually reach the coastline and get those guys before they got them off? So. That was the interest for me. And it was a sort of bit of a detective um, research problem to identify how that happened. And, and I think really by the end uh, of the book, I got there. I could uh, really rationally and objectively say certain things that certainly hadn't been mentioned before. And I suppose in a sense that's revisionary. For example, the, the impact of the Royal Air Force. I think... Um, Many of the contemporary documentaries we get on the um, cable TV channels is very, very superficial. You know, a couple of spitfires turn the tide of the battle in the West. Um, what I realised reading the German documents was that it wasn't about the fighters because they never saw them, but they were being constantly harassed by British bombers that were causing material damage to the advance toward Dunkirk. And for the first time in the campaign in the West, the German army was very sensitive to being attacked from the air and material damage was caused. So that for me was interesting. Um, the other thing is I looked at the um, little ships and the um, naval effort and essentially you could say that 85% of the soldiers were lifted off by Royal Navy destroyers. And so the only way you're gonna stop the evacuation is by seriously denting the carrying capacity of the Royal Navy to get them off. And so I looked at that and the Kriegsmarine, the German Navy failed. They did score some isolated successes with E-boats and U-boats, but they failed. 
And so the only other possibility of denting the uh, allied ship carrying capacity is the Luftwaffe and then looking at the records and all the rest. Over the nine day evacuation period, it became clear, clear that only two and a half days enabled um, sufficiently clear weather to prosecute effective air attacks uh, against Dunkirk. So that, again, was another failure. Um, the final um, interesting fact was really something I'd experienced before uh, in the Gulf War, which is when you're winning, the prospect of a ceasefire is um, a very welcome one because then you've got a future. And these German soldiers saw nothing but wrecked British equipment on the roads to Dunkirk, and they became complacent and also at the same time more risk adverse because why risk your life if we've won this war? This campaign's pretty well wrapped up and uh, we've got it in the bag. And that actually has an impact on the impetus of the German soldiers closing in onto the pocket in morale terms. And, and that shouldn't be underestimated because we've seen the um, willingness of the Ukrainian uh, troops today to fight and die for their cause that makes an enormous difference. And at this stage in the campaign, the Germans must have been saying to themselves, well, what's the point of this? Um, 10 British divisions got away, but 62 Allied divisions have been demolished and another 17 or 19 severely mauled. So 10 British divisions getting away is small fry. And at the same time, so what? When they get back to the UK mainland, they're going to surrender anyway, because Churchill won't be able to stand this catastrophe. So that, in a sense, was my start point. Um, I didn't really want to get into uh, what the British had done necessarily to um, secure the evacuation, because there's been an endless number of books on that. I was more interested in why didn't the Germans stop them from getting away? And that, in essence, was is what the book is about. Well, that's a brilliant introduction. And as we all, all those of us who are watching this know, is that it all has been perceived to be the Holt Order. We will get to the Holt Order later on. Everything about the Germans' failure has been because of Hitler issuing the, the, that order. And we'll say we'll expand on that in, later on. And to kind of build on this idea of that. The mythology really is that the, the the accepted understanding is the RAF weren't present. The Luftwaffe were lethal. The Stukas died bombing all the columns of refugees, died bombing the retreating British troops. Troops, um, the the German Blitzkrieg being efficiently lethal, trudging on, and they were going to smash their way to Dunkirk. And we'll get to it later on. You 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 make the point that with all the canals and things around northern France and Belgium, yeah. they were already starting to bog down days before the Holt order came in. So. You know, we've we've tackled some of the that aspect of 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 the mythology, and that, now we're going to dig in a bit deep. And folks, what we'll do today, particularly, is is it's quite lots of questions. We're not doing a full presentation well, because perhaps it, I should say a few words about the whole Holt order. Yeah, because yeah, please do. I think that lies at the heart of the myth because virtually every channel TV documentary I've seen over the last five years or something um, claims that. Because Hitler halted the panzers, um, the Brits got away. Um, I don't believe that's entirely true. And I looked at that because it, it seemed strange to me um, that this could be claimed. Um, the first bit of revisionary um, research, well, it wasn't particularly revisionary, but people managed to work out that it wasn't Hitler that actually instituted the halt order. It was von Rundstedt who did. And Hitler simply confirmed it. So it was the um, decision by the commander of Army Group A that had the Panzer Vanguard that did this. So I thought, well, if if this was such an emotionally disturbing thing to happen, how come the German soldiers never seemed to mention it? And I looked at all the um, records of the German units that were around the southern part of that boot-shaped pocket, which were the motorised and panzer units, to try and see or discern any frustration that they'd been stopped. And really, again, in, with my own sort of armoured background experience that I have um, had, um, you always have various pauses in the advance in order to get the ammunition up, 
work out what the next phase line is going to be before you move on. So to halt um, briefly after such a long advance, in fact, right across mainland France, uh, is no big deal. And then, and for the Germans, it was no big deal. Um, some of the senior commanders knew what was going on and were frustrated. But when I looked at the, the personal accounts or the junior officer accounts, practically no mention at all about the whole order. And it, in terms of its significance as the Fuhrer uh, allowing the British to get away. I mean, that, that, that just doesn't figure. I couldn't find any evidence at all that it was a big deal. The other thing, of course, is that if you read all the British veteran um, accounts of the evacuation, again, I, 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 th I can't remember ever coming across an account that was worried about the panzers breaking through to the boats on the coast. There was never a panzer fear, if you like, actually on the beaches. <coughs> so the bottom line is that the only panzer attack against the pocket happened on the west side from the direction of Graveline. Uh, and that was the first panzer division. And they were beaten off by the French even before the halt order was instituted on the 24th of May. By the end of the day, the 24th of May, the halt order came in and first panzer had already been beaten to a standstill really because it couldn't penetrate the uh, canal line on the west side of the Dunkirk perimeter. And you've mentioned this already. <coughs> Dunkirk, which became very apparent to me when I was walking around doing the reconnaissance of the battlefield tour, is a myriad of concentric waterways and canals and herringbone drainage ditches all the way around the area where they were trying to evacuate the troops. You can't even get a truck across it, let alone a, um, a, a panzer. So um, it made enormous sense for the panzers to pause because it wasn't tank country and it would have been foolish to carry on. No, it's a good point. And I think I want to expand on the idea as well that Dunkirk, of course, became the focal point for the British retreat, although, of course, there was Operation Ariel later on and Cherbourg and the other ports, and we covered that on the channel a few weeks ago. But the Germans aren't aiming to get to Dunkirk. The Germans are trying to defeat the Belgian, French, British armies and conquer the whole of France. So Dunkirk isn't necessarily uh, any more important on their radar than, than the rest of France. Is, is that fair to say? Yes. Um, I mean, you could be... Um you could claim that for the Germans, Dunkirk was simply a signpost on the on, on the road to Paris. Mm. Um, it was of little it was of little consequence. Um, there wasn't a huge battle in their terms being fought there. And um, in the event, it was 10 German divisions from the way over 100 that were in the campaign that finally uh, reduced the Dunkirk perimeter. And the main problem for them around the Dunkirk perimeter was moving all the motorised units out to take part in the second part of the battle, um, juxtaposed against the infantry units marching up in the opposite direction uh, to take over and relieve their positions on the coast. So it was, for the Germans, inconsequential. They'd won, uh, so far as they're concerned, and the important thing now was to knock France out of the war. And the fall of France, we, we probably forget, um, is the equivalent today as if China defeated the United States. That was the impact it had on the European mainland, which was really the, the centre of the political world at, at, at that time. It wasn't all about an Atlantic alliance. The focus of influence and power lay in Central Europe. No, definitely. And I think, you know, to, get, to continue and expand on the idea, I'd like you to kind of explain a little bit about particularly from the, well, not particularly, especially from the German point of view, how they perceive this whole push into France. Because, 
again, we're burdened with the uh, all this concept of Blitzkrieg, and every time it comes up in these sort of cable TV documentaries, you have the, the screaming of the Stuka engines, you have the columns of retreating French civilians, you have the British army appearing to be in disarray, running away, the French being hopeless, the Belgians being hopeless, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One of the things that I, I appreciate in your book was how post-battle, how the Germans considered their big victory was defeating the elite French. I mean, the, the British, they, they didn't really have as much of a respect and consideration for. That was a real kind of a mic drop moment is, that, is how much reputation they had and how proud they were of defeating that French army and indeed the Belgian army. And again, this idea we have that these they, they were rolled over very effectively. How did the Germans perceive? Well, let's start off with how did the Germans at the beginning of this campaign perceive those three forces they were facing, the British, the French and the Belgians? Well, the the guy that was responsible for the intelligence on enemy forces was it was an Oberst Colonel Ulrich Liss, and he wrote a book um, after the war in German, of course, and he reproduced his appreciation that he gave to the Army Land Command of what they thought they'd be up against in the event of. The, uh, an advance into the West. And he assessed the Belgians, for example, as likely to be weak uh, because there is a social divide in Belgium which exists today between the Flemings and the Walloons. He felt that they would be defensive in, in the battles that they fought and they would follow French principles. And actually... He completely underestimated them because um, the German post-action reports really rather extol the um, effectiveness of Belgian resistance when Army Group B uh, fought its way through Belgium. Um, the 18th Division commander, General Krantz, who took the surrender at Dunkirk in his post-action report, said actually um, none of the enemy forces was particularly um, effective, by which he meant the Brits, the French and the Belgians. And he said, perhaps if there was one that shone beyond the others, it was the Belgians. And it was because the Belgians did quite often give German divisions trying to cross the river lines in Belgium a bloody nose. And they fought all the way back. Now, the Brits were very sniffy about the Belgians and rather... Um, blame the Belgians for a stab in the back by surrendering at the last moment. But to be fair to the Belgians, they'd run out of land to retire to. They'd fought all the way back. They'd only followed the same progress as the British on their right, who also had had to fall back because of the French um, debacle on their right. So the Belgians um, fought just as hard as the Brits falling back, and certainly harder than the French. And Liss totally underestimated them, uh, in my opinion, when you, when you look at the um, uh, post-action reports. Now, his view of the French was that they would be defensively minded, they would be better in defence. They're very much influenced by the First World War. He thought they were poorly trained, and that their best units would be in northwest France, which made sense because the Allied offensive started in northwest France and was supposed to go into uh, Germany um, to um, occupy the line that they'd chosen in Belgium to block a, re a repeat of a, of a pseudo Schlieffen plan. The fact that their best units in, were, in fact, in northwest France meant they were still there when the fighting occurred around Dunkirk. So res French resistance was pretty um, firm and fierce in places uh, around the Dunkirk perimeter. So far as the British were concerned, Liss had spent, was an artillery man by profession, and he'd spent some time with the British Royal Artillery on Salisbury Plain. And his assessment on the Brits was that they had high morale, good NCOs, but their officers were poor, but he felt they would be prepared to take heavy casualties. 
and they had a number of veterans, of course, from their imperial wars. He thought the territorial army units would be of less worth because he had seen them on Salisbury Plain um, in England. So all in all, if you put that together, um, slightly backtracking on um, how difficult the French would be to overcome, literally writing off the French um, and the Brits, he felt, would give a good account of themselves, but they weren't numerous enough. Well, that's a great summary. For, 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 so thank you very much for that. So the, the German push towards the coast, I mean, again, the, you know, the, the, cliche, the cliche of the, the speedy moving tanks with the out, motorbike outriders and the Stugas and things like that. Uh, from your investigation of both the, 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 the divisional reports, the commander's reports, and what the men were saying themselves, um, let's start off with right at the beginning of this. What was the motivation for your average, you know, kind of not junior officer, kind of middle ranking, you know, captains, majors? Were they thinking this was going to be a swift campaign? What where, what was their, their aspirations and hopes? How did it start for them? Some of them have been through Poland and what have you already. So give us a summary of what their attitudes were going into this. I think I think the German army at this time was had a certain idealistic fervour, which certainly the Allies didn't have, they felt that they were going to be righting the wrongs of Versailles, the Versailles Treaty, which was very punitive uh, with regard to Germany. There had been a French occupation of the Ruhr, reparations had been severe, and the um, average German soldier was keen to put what they considered to be an injustice put right. Now, what I found interesting is the, the content of the German army at this time, uh, it changed as the war progressed, but at this time, you've got a very large element of soldiers who had fought in the First World War in the Kaiserreich and would, were, were trained as reservists in that period. Then you had the um, period of the Reichswehr as well, which was a, really a, tra a traditional continuation uh, in army training of what, what happened in the um, Kaiserreich. And then when, the, uh, when Hitler came to power in 1933, he followed it with conscription in 35. So between 1935 to uh, 1939, you had successive conscription waves of soldiers who were essentially uh, had been to school uh, in National Socialist Nazi Germany. And what is interesting, one of the divisions that comes up against the um, Dunkirk perimeter, the 216th, um, when I looked at its record, uh, what I found was that uh, one third of its content had fought in the First World War, 1914 mm. to 18. A third of them had been conscripted into the Wehrmacht after 1935, and the remaining third were simply eight-week soldiers who had been called up at the last moment and had only had that amount of training. Now, that particular unit suffered quite badly in Belgium, um, crossing some of the uh, water lines, and had already suffered considerable casualties um, before it, it, it arrived on the coast. The other point about the German army at this time is despite all the films uh, that we see and generally the documentaries show um, footage from Sieg in Westen, the uh, victory in the West that the Germans produced after the um, campaign, which is primarily motorised and panzer units rolling inexorably um, towards the coast, but only 16 of the over 150 German divisions that took part were in fact panzer or motorized. So this is a very small element. And so <clears throat> the vast majority of this um, army was advancing through F France as their predecessors had done in 1914 uh, on foot with all their logistics and artillery horse drawn. And what is particularly prevalent in all the German diaries are accounts of German soldiers talking about their fathers who had died um, near the areas that they were operating in at that time. And one of them wrote in his diary, oh, if only they could see 
to the 1914, 18 generation, the dead ones, now, uh, when they reach the coast, if they could come out of their graves and march down here, look what they would see. So there was this kind of idealistic fervor. And this army is much different from that that invaded Barbarossa um, in 1941. Because from 1941 onward, the campaign in the um, east shows the Wehrmacht, the average German soldier, really losing his moral compass by allowing all these atrocities and whatnot to take place. But that level of um, handling of the civilian population was not happening in 1940 at this stage. There have been a few excesses in Poland, which some German soldiers had obviously seen. But the Germans who invaded in 1940 were the last army that um, could feel idealistic in the sense, say, of the Israeli army prior to the 1967 war, when they're called the Young Lions of Israel after their amazing victory um, over the Arabs in the Six Day War. Well, the German army that marches into France has got this sort of fervour about it, which it never has after, after this campaign. No, well, thank you for that. And we're getting some questions coming in now. So we'll, we'll do a few a little flurry of questions now. And and I apologize, they'll be kind of going back and forth in the timeline, a bit of a scattergun approach, but we'll do it as they're coming in. And I'll so we'll reword some of them a little bit to, 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 to get them back. So the quick one, the easy one to answer, yes or no, were any German POWs taken back from Dunkirk? And you expand on that. Were there any Germans who then, who then wrote anything down if they were prisoners of the British? Um. I didn't come across any uh, accounts by German prisoners of war. Some were cer certainly taken back um, across the channel. Um, I mentioned one, I think, a Luftwaffe officer who was being taken down one of the jetties when German shelling destroyed the jetty and, and this chap jumps off and hides under the jetty and waits until the Germans actually reach the um, coast uh, when he's saved. But no... Um, particular accounts uh, by German PWs. And really, you've got to say, why would there be? Because they were they were an insignificant handful. Yeah, true. No, good point. Um, this one I'm gonna, from the History Explorer, I'm going to expand on it. Did the Citadel at Berg provide much resistance? Seems like key terrain on the approach of Dunkirk. We've got C Cassel as well and what have you. So but I'm going to spin the question the other way. You know, you're, you're talking about the German reconnaissance in advance, the anticipation of the British, French and Belgian responses. But had they, in their, their assessment of the, the terrain, realised there are these particularly kind of high features or important features that could potentially provide the Allies with these bastions of, of defence? And, and if so, how did they write about them? The Citadel at Berg was probably the linchpin of the southern part of the perimeter. And it was a point where the 18th Division eventually breaks through. So it, it was of particular importance, but it wasn't necessarily noticed until the latter stages of the battle, because one of the reasons why the Germans perform so uh, poorly at this stage in the campaign as they gather around the perimeter is that um, reaching the coast was a magic moment, totally unexpected, that they get there so quickly. So when they get to the coast, there is no plan. And they weren't briefed on a plan either. So when they get there, it's left in the hands of the commanders at the operational level to come up with solutions to problems. And they didn't always get it right because, for example, Guderian who is the first on the scene to reach the coast with his 19th Panzer Corps, has got three Panzer divisions, and he sends one division against Boulogne, another against um, Calais, and another one against um, Dunkirk. There is no Schwerpunkt or main point of effort, and the Schwerpunkt normally gets the core artillery, um, which can be pretty devastating. And so Guderian, because he had that uninterrupted advance across France, rather assumed that resistance would now um, simply collapse. But the fighting for Boulogne and Calais was hard and Panzer costly. And uh, to the extent that the German high command 
forbade the use of panzers in Calais after a time. Uh, but the first panzer division didn't even get near Dunkirk anyway and was stopped at the canal line. So the problem there was um, because of a lack of a coherent plan and the initiative was taken by commanders on the ground who thought they would get away with it, they failed. They were unsupported. Well, thank you for that. Um, this one is uh, interesting to go back in time to that period from kind of the, the autumn of 19, uh, uh, 1939 is that during the phony war period, and, and I, hey, I'll ask you, what did the Germans have a name for that period? I mean, the phony war is something that we've labelled it our, ourselves, although tell that to people in Poland, it was much, not much of a phony war going on there. But how were the Germans able to deal with that period before the, the advance of the France of just being ready to go? And how many are we talking about as well? How many Germans eventually were part of the force that moved into France or northern France and Belgium? Uh, there were 40 German divisions initially holding the line in France when the rest of the German army in, in, invaded Poland. And this phony war period is called Sitzkrieg, which you can probably understand. Mm. And essentially, there were two things going on. It was a particularly severe winter, and the German army was tasked to assist the German civilian population in moving essential raw materials around. And they were also training hard because they knew there would be a spring offensive. Whereas on the other side of the line, the Brits were bored out their tiny mines uh, and the French uh, digging or improving holes. Their heart wasn't in it. They saw the spectre of a repeat of the trench warfare of 1418 and were rather dreading uh, a highly attritional war. So... For all the reasons I mentioned before, there was a certain German idealism that they believed in this war and felt that they would prosecute it successfully, as distinct from the other side who didn't want the war and were going out of their way to do anything to support it. Mm. Well, thank you for that answer. And so let's get back to the, the events leading up to the infamous Holt Order, which we discussed has been the the hook that everybody every a lot of historians have put this whole campaign onto so you know we're talking about a massive great german force moving through a very very wide area with a very limited amount of panzer troops that have had all the attention there's all the infantry division much of it's horse drawn there's communication issues there's transport issues there's the 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 fact they're not going to know in advance which areas are going to be putting up a better defense and which going to be easier to be overrun so the situation is going to be fluid and changing on a day-to-day -day basis um, where, where did you think it started going ra going wrong before the Holt Order, and why was it going wrong? Well, you could probably assess that Hitler had lost control of Blitzkrieg by the time it reached the coast, because when the uh, when Guderian and the Panzer Vanguard crossed the Meuse, a um, couple of days later. Um, Guderian is castigated by his commander, von Kleist, for advancing too quickly forward without infantry support. Guderian thought he was going to get a pat on the head for doing really well and promptly turned around and offered his resignation, which could only be rescinded when von Rundstedt, the army group commander, personally stepped in. So the... German high command, the uh, uh, Halder, the chief of the general staff, and von Brautich, the um, army chief, these are 1914-18 veterans uh, schooled in static positional attritional warfare. They felt um, that the um, panzer advance would succeed, but it it succeeded beyond their wildest expectation. And it wasn't just the senior generals. Um, this is evident in the uh, diaries from German soldiers as well. There was a constant fear that the French would come out of nowhere, as they did in the Battle of the Marne in 1914, which unexpectedly put paid to the Schlieffen plan. And the feeling amongst the troops was 
surely it can't be this easy. There, there, there's a joker in the pack here somewhere and we're going to catch it in the back of the neck. At the high command level, there was this real concern that the panzers were outrunning the infantry support marching up behind and by pushing very deeply into um, uh, moving west ahead of the main force with exposed flanks, uh, they, they were going to come to grief. And when uh, Rommel's um, 7th Panzer Division was hit in the flank by a couple of weak regiment, RTR regiments, um, Rommel actually marked on the headquarters map in, uh, that he had that he was being attacked by five divisions. And that was just um, typical of the way the Germans thought this was going. They thought there must be a mailed fist that is going to descend upon us somewhere. So Guderian was halted on a number of occasions until he reaches the coast. And then there was a very vulnerable period um, before the rest of the forces caught up. Hitler himself um, was um, also very much concerned with the controversy about the speed of the panzer advance versus the infantry plodding along behind. And he goes to visit um, uh, von Rundstedt to see how it's going. And when he arrives, unfortunately, uh, von Brautich had already transferred the panzer arm from von Rundstedt to von Bock's uh, Army Group B in order to make the reduction of the pocket in northwest France, the Dunkirk perimeter, simpler. Um, and it was a, a logical move. But Hitler hadn't even been consulted and really gives um, von Brautich a total bawling out. He humiliates him. And this causes real um, tension in the German high command. So there, there are real concerns about what they're seeing on the ground. They know they're reaching the coast. They know they're achieving this um, amazing victory, but they can't quite encompass the scale of, of, of what they're achieving. But so, then, sorry, and they are achieving and this monumental advance. They have covered a lot of ground, but at the same time, there are so also not only are they they worried about this as you say this mailed fist hitting them from out of the blue somewhere. There's also they're realizing there's some shortcomings in their own armor divisions and they haven't got enough Panzer Grenadiers, particularly when they get into towns and the and the, the built up areas. There's not enough infantry support there, and they're also contrary to the popular opinion, they're, they're quite worried about the RAF as well. The RAF, as you said, the bombers are, are, are disrupted, disrupting the, the rear lines. So, is there a little bit of a disconnect? from the kind of lower command level to the higher command level in the Germans of exactly how this battle is going. Yes, yes, there is. Um, as I mentioned before, talking about the halt order, the soldiers aren't concerned, the officers are. They mm. can see what's going on. But, it, but very few of them actually make the point at the time. Much of this whinging about the um, port order comes from senior German commanders after the war, when it is already proven that Hitler takes some very questionable decisions at Stalingrad, at Kursk, and various other uh, crisis points, and that, therefore, Hitler's to blame for all this. But actually, um, there was a need to halt the panzers, uh, because they're not going to get across these, um, which, which were now becoming increasingly flooded areas. And as I said before, looking in some detail at what the soldiers were saying about the halt, um, it, it doesn't seem to be a particularly momentous event. Uh, in fact, very few of them uh, mention it at all. The other thing is the only people that pretty well um, survive this war uh, in the combat arms are the officers. Uh, 
because their survival prospects are far superior to the average panzer crewman or infantry soldier. And the 10 German divisions that eventually reduced the uh, Dunkirk pocket, all of those divisions were destroyed in Russia. So not many people came back. So not many people are going to write about this because, as I said before, Dunkirk is a signpost on the road to Paris. What's more important to these guys is what happened at Stalingrad, at Kursk and various other decisive theatres uh, later in the war. Uh, but as so few of them came back, there were, you don't hear many voices um, arguing the toss that the whole order was uh, a stupid mistake. Well, let's bring this back. The whole the, the build up of the, of the Dunkirk story and Churchill's point of view is that in any good story, for the hero to prevail, and as you said, the, the, the Dunkirk, the battle there is a is a fiasco. It's a failure. The the miracle of the the salvation of the army is a is the bright spot in otherwise what is a defeat. But to make that evacuation more worthwhile and to have seemed more of an achievement. It was important for the British and the Allies to build up the efficiency of the Germans because a strong villain is easy, is better to over to have been uh, escaped from than a weak villain. So this is you know, the whole idea about the, the lethality of the German advance. It's been, it's been part of the British uh, mentality as well, or the British narrative of the story. We've got a question now. You've partly covered this already about the failure of the Germans to anticipate the ability of the Royal Navy to evacuate the fleet. But Rob Crane asks the, the question, were the Germans also possibly cautious about coming into shelling range of the Royal Navy? So again, we're thinking about the armoured divisions approaching Calais, Dunkirk, uh, uh, Boulogne. Is that something that was a factor? Uh, yes. Um, it caused some problems, but the major issue was more about German shelling from the coast impeding the evacuation routes. Um, th these were X-ray uh, Yankee and um, can't remember the other Zulu. Three primary routes to get back to the UK. One of them was off the coast of Calais, and that was blocked once the uh, Germans had captured Calais, because all the shipping that needed to come near Calais could be bracketed by onshore artillery. The next point was that German artillery finally manages to get at least close enough to start shelling the port area of Dunkirk. And then the final um, nail in the coffin for the evacuation is that the um, 18th Army, um, pushing its divisions down from the east from Belgium, uh, finally get Bray Dune. Um, uh, no, not Bray Dune. Um, the area near Newport, the beaches in Belgium, actually under fire as well. So it was more about what the Germans were doing to impede, impede the Royal Navy rather than the other way around. Right. OK. Um, again, the, the Germans are taking a, a situation that is that starts off with this feeling you said there about their their moral victory they're reclaiming the the areas that some of them had actually fought over them before them, themselves before and if they hadn't themselves their fathers or their uncles had so they're they're sensed they're 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 writing a wrong they're on they're, they're the they're the heroes of the story. The advances are incredible. The, the, everything's going very well, except that, as you said, the, the, the supply line is going to extend it. There's an issue with a lack of support in the towns. There's, there's, not, there's the uncertainty about the, the, what they're going to do when they get towards the coast. And then, you know, we now have the, 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 the halt order. But get, give us a couple of examples of other things that were starting to go wrong from the German point of view that you kind of discovered that weren't possibly uh, aware to the officers themselves at the time? Um, I think the key thing is you've got two army groups approaching an ever-diminishing area of land held by the Allies. You've got Army Group B coming from um, uh, east to west, and you've got Army Group A pushing up from the south. And the shape of the German pocket by the time of the halt order was rather the, like the outline of a boot, with uh, Army Group A pressing against the sole and heel 
and Army Group B uh, pressing against the the uh, lace area of the boot, if you like. Now, at the toe, you've got the division between Army Group B and A, lack of coordination there. One of the big problems of working with um, units from uh, a different formation is tying up fire support and in particular preventing what's called a blue on blue uh, friendly fire as you start coming together. So you've got these two massive armies, army groups, coming from two different directions, converging on the same piece of ground. As they converge on that piece of ground, they run out of space because you've got um, something like, I think it's 40 to 50 divisions uh, moving into that area. Um, there's only room for about 10 around the uh, Dunkirk perimeter which means the combat power of those advancing divisions can't be brought to bear because they're all constrained. There's only a finite number of roads. And as I mentioned before, there was no plan what to do on arrival. When the orders eventually came, we've got to get on with Operation Rolt, which is the campaign to subjugate the rest of France. All the motorized units along the Seoul or toward the south of the perimeter, they've all got to be withdrawn and replaced by infantry units. And the requisite number of infantry units from Army Group B need to be brought to bear also to um, collapse the perimeter. Now, no decision is made about overall command of the forces to reduce the perimeter until quite late in the battle, um, toward the end of May, when General Kuchler, the commander of the 18th Army, is given command of 10 divisions to sort out the German, uh, the Dunkirk perimeter. Now, because of the extensive flooding, which has got worse, which is what the Allies implemented to protect themselves even further, to add to the concentric um, water, uh, canals and waterways uh, around the uh, perimeter itself, um, because of that, only five of those 10 divisions were in any um, way able to bring some combat power to bear. The 18th um, Division that I talk about in the book uh, describe its advance into uh, the town of Dunkirk eventually in the end, um, can't even find enough dry land to put its artillery to keep them in range as the infantry move forward. And when you look there the photographs in the book um, showing the axis of advance, all you see ahead is a floodplain. So there were enormous difficulties uh, for the Germans um, toward the end. So you've got um, failure of command and coordination, huge traffic jams of vehicles going um, out of the area and others um, coming in. All this now being harassed by Royal Air Force um, bombing. And actually, not until later in the day is anyone in charge. OK, well, thank you for that. I'm just checking with the questions again now. And we're having various people talking about Rommel and other commanders there. So, well, you know, anybody who was anybody was part of this because of the enormity of, of, um, of, of two armies approaching. But... In your assessment, again, from the German point of view, who were the kind of heroes and villains in terms of who did their, who comes out of this having performed very well and who, in your estimation, perhaps didn't do as well as they could have done? Um, well, it's very easy to be an armchair general, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, nobody comes out of it particularly well in the reduction of the Dunkirk perimeter, uh, which is what I'm dealing with here. Um, Hitler had lost control of Blitzkrieg, really. Um, his um, operational level commanders couldn't come up with an original um, solution to the plan, assuming that because of the largely um, easy advance across mainland France, the same would happen here when these people have got their backs to the wall. And the German soldiers themselves are becoming more risk adverse because they think, well, we've won here. Um, why don't we just let them go? Uh, because we need to get to Paris. 
Okay, well, thank you for that. Pat, Pat is asking about the Royal Navy. I know we're focusing on the German point of view, but the, the fact the Royal Navy were worried about German guns on the coast and, and, and weren't able to give more artillery support is, I know that's that the, you know, the Allied side isn't really your focus there, but it, that, is that something you would agree with? Uh, you, you're referring to this question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the information I have about the impact of Royal Naval Artillery is anecdotal in the sense that occasionally, not too often, um, German officers talk about the Royal Navy um, pounding uh, their positions. So they've got to be quite careful um, as they're advancing to the post coast. Uh, but this is not a this is not an overriding concern. And actually, okay. the Royal Navy is more concerned with lifting people out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, 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 it's about the evacuation. But I mean, um, we're we're getting towards the end of this this session now. But the 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 British come out of this, and the world comes out of this with the miracle of Dunker, little chips, Churchill speeches, what have you. We've already touched on this already, but. As you said, the Germans in many ways perceived Dunkirk as a signpost on the way to, to Paris. But any other things that you, you found in particular the writings of the men who were there about how they felt after the campaign? Did they, you know, they obviously 100,000 know, Brits had escaped their capture. Well, the, you know, that, that was, a, that was an annoying, but they didn't necessarily think that was the, the end of it. They were still proud of, a, of, a, of this enormous advance. They were still, they were, they bested the French army, the Belgian armies. But were there any kind of common denominators in the experience? and the reflections of the Germans post this battle? There is, but um, the difficulty here is, as I said before, um, so few of them eventually survived. So the main comment is stuff that was written in diaries at the time or in books that were published in um, National Socialist Germany in 1941 um, uh, and 42, when the war was still going well. And the overriding comment if there is a common comment, was um, we've won here. Uh, we're looking at the detrius of a defeated army. Um, and that's it. This is a scene of devastation. Um, uh, wait out for the British surrender. It won't be long now. Mm. And that is the overriding view. Um, and the, the German soldiers were immensely proud at what they'd achieved. That is another thing that comes from it, pride of what they'd done. Um, and, and quite often they are saying that uh, we've achieved this in less weeks than it took years to do it during the First World War, um, which when you read the old um, uh, SS uh, secret files, briefings to the German uh, senior commanders, there's a mention in there of many of the First World War veterans um, getting a bit sniffy about um, young German soldiers and officers getting a bit above themselves, saying how much they've achieved, whereas, whereas they had no idea uh, what they'd been through during the First World War. OK, thanks for that. And kind of then to moving on from that, any other things that we've over we haven't mentioned already, any other kind of revelations about the Germans experiences campaign that you, you, you think are worth sharing with the audience? Yeah, I think perhaps a decisive moment when the Germans could have wrapped it up but didn't was when the Belgians surrendered on the 28th of May, which created a huge military vacuum to the uh, northeast of the perimeter. And if the Germans had had a prescribed plan in waiting, uh, they could have reached the beaches coming from the east and rolled up the entire evacuation coastline. And the Belgian surrender shouldn't have been a surprise. Um, it had been spoken about in the German army, but they didn't know when it was going to come. But it was obvious that it would only be a matter of days. So it should have been incumbent upon senior German commanders to actually prepare for that, because when you, uh, what we do know is that the Belgians were certainly warning the Brits off that they've only got about two or three days uh, fight left in them. And they did what they could to annul the impact of that, because, for example, the Belgians passed loads of trucks onto the French um, just before they surrendered. 
But the reason why the Germans weren't able to utilize this advantage because suddenly 22 divisions put down their arms, that's a lot of men, mixed in with all the refugees, completely clogged up all the roads, and the Germans couldn't move and take advantage of what they should have seen coming. Okay, well, thank you for that. And my final question is going to be really, and you know, you've you've you know, you're serving British Army uh, soldier. You have written about numerous campaigns and numerous wars. So there's a two part question: is what lessons did the Germans learn about advancing through countries that they did take on to future operations, and what should they have learnt? And, and didn't pass on or continue or adapt for future campaigns. So what did they learn and what didn't they learn? I think um, what happened was that they honed the whole Blitzkrieg um, concept to a very high level so that the initial campaign in Russia in that first summer and autumn was devastatingly effective. So they learned a great deal about the movement of large bodies of vehicles and troops rapidly to wherever they're needed on the front. In addition, they learned an enormous amount about Luftwaffe ground close support, which benefited the campaign in Russia. So all those amazing victories that they scored uh, in the opening stages of Barbarossa you could put down to what they'd learned in France. Okay, and what did what should they have learned? That's difficult to say because um, what was there to learn? They'd won. True. Yeah, I mean, again, you it's, it, it's you normally you normally get your major lessons from things that go wrong. In life, we tend not to remember how we got our successes, but we do remember why things went wrong. That's true. I mean, a couple of people at McGuillem has noticed they didn't learn a lot about logistics, but then that's, a, you know, that every side, every nation is always learning about logistics because logistics is an eternally difficult true. situation. That's very true because um, logistics in Russia did not work too well. No, indeed. I mean, it's it's comparing apples and oranges in some in some ways. I mean, the, obviously, the, the early yeah. advance between Barbarossa and, and, and France is similar. But when you get to the, the, the next phase, it's an entire different terrain, different country, different dif dis different distances, different commanders, different well, enemy. They, Everything becomes different. I mean, they moved from um, use utilizing a Western superior rail and road network to um, very few hard roads um, in Russia. Okay. Well, final question. I said that would be fine, but this is the final, final one. Is what are your hopes for and takeaways for people who read the book? You know, those that have read lots of books about 1940 or lots of books about the Blitzkrieg or the Miracle of Little Ships, what are you hoping their takeaways will be? Well, I'm, well, I'm hoping they'll see some new material in there because I've purposely kept away from the traditional view of Dunkirk. I haven't ignored it and I haven't in any way cheapened uh, what the achievement was, I have said that I set out to give the German perspective and I've concentrated on that because I prefer not to write about stuff that people have already dealt with before. I like to move into new ground. So I'm hoping um, this has uncovered some new ground. Well, it certainly has. And folks, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I recommend you, you you purchase it straight away. There are links in the description below, or you can buy it at your own local bookshop or online as you prefer. So um, uh, thank you very much for joining us, Robert. And I hope you'll be back again, because I'll say some of your, your books are absolute classics in the world of military history. The, you know, the Arnhem book, particularly the Moscow book, the, the Omaha Beach book, they're all, they're all absolute legends. I've been a little bit starstruck speaking to you. It's one of, you're one of my absolute history heroes. It's been fantastic talking to you. So, folks, thank you for your attention today. And, Rob, did you, Bob, did you enjoy it, Bob? Yes, yes. I hope, I hope your viewers got something from it. We did, certainly. So thanks, everybody, for watching. This is Paul Woodad and Robert Kershaw for World War II TV saying I will see you all next week. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for your attention. Bye. Okay.